First Corinthians third chapter three. Sing out that donation will kick off in about a minute. And if you've missed any of the previous podcasts, please catch us up. See me looking on the side, it's because I have my laptop here, which is how we're broadcasting. Now, we're not going to read through chapter three. We read through it a few times. If you've missed the uh, last few weeks that we've been covering chapter three, please avail yourself right here on the channel, as well as if you're connected to me on my own Facebook channel, by all means, please avail yourself uh, where you'll be able to get all of those broadcasts that's being posted there. And so you'll be able to catch up to where we are going to start in and around, I believe it's verse 12 and 13 this evening. So that means we've covered the first 11 verses of the chapter. So I don't want to do too much review because obviously that's quite a bit, as you can see, part 10. So we're moving along pretty, pretty, pretty good. And we're walking through, by the way, we're walking through Corinthians. Uh, first Corinthians and then of course on the second Corinthians. So this is we're going to be at this for several months, maybe even to the summer uh, who knows beyond that. So uh, we are working through this phrase by phrase, verse by verse uh, to some extent. Just pulling out of the great truths that's in it, what Paul was saying to the church in Corinth, what applies to us. And here's the key for those who are teaching preachers of the scriptures. Yeah, I, now, I have not been formally trained to go by verse. So why am I doing it? Well, because what I've understood and learned as I've studied in God's word, especially over the last several years, is that when we don't go verse by verse, when we don't go, in some cases, word by word, looking at the Greek, looking at the Hebrew, I, yeah, I know, is we, in a sense, cheat ourselves, and we also, in our study, and we cheat when we preach and teach, we, we cheat the audience in so much as not we intend to. I don't think there's a malicious intention to, to cheat the audience. We want to give them what the Lord says. But what does the Lord say? Genesis to Revelation. What does the Lord say? Chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In other words, he's inspired all that is written. So when we're taking verses here, and understand, I've done that most of my ministry. But verses here and verses there, to some extent, uh, you know, we're, we're in some sense cheating. We're, we're cheating ourselves and the people because we're not getting, now we'll say context, context, context. I heard that growing up. I say it all the time. But imagine briefly, and, I, and, I, and we'll get into this tonight, what happens when we don't teach, preach verse by verse, what we're, we're saying verse by verse, we're saying Scripture interprets scripture, which is an analogy of faith, uh, uh, but ultimately because we're not really actually teaching a whole path, we're not teaching or preaching that whole passage, what we're doing is we're saying, yeah, you go and get that, you go read it. Now, here's my isolated point. So can you see what end up happening? So, some people get lost in translation, and of course, having done this for a year or two or three or however many, 20-something uh, I, I've heard that more than once. And there are people who are faithful to subject preaching. I'm not, not here to suggest otherwise, but it becomes somewhat um, a precarious situation. And I know there's teachers and preachers and, and, and on and on and on on the channel, so I want to get that to you. And so I've accepted the challenge. That means it's some tremendous study. So when you hear John, John MacArthur say, I spend 30 hours a week, now you understand why. Because it does take faithful study time. Well, I work on job. Well, 
if you read, and this is scripture, this is not me, what did the, the apostles say? Select among you seven, which of course we call deacons, to, to handle the vicissitudes and solicitudes, to handle life, so we can give our prayer, etc. So ultimately, this is really meant, and, I, and I'm not saying if you're not doing it full time, you're wrong, no. But, but to really do this and to do it faithfully to the text, requires either some extraordinary study and working full-time. My, my father and others have done it or full-time. Now, of course, that means living a life very, <sighs> uh, needless to say, not everybody is going to be wealthy. Uh, <laughs> most uh, who do this, you don't get wealthy. You just really don't. You don't become famous. You don't get wealthy. You just don't. And the time and the painstaking time it takes. And I'm sharing this in a general sense also for those who are not meant to be preachers and teachers, but to understand you want to, to be under the ministry of those who faithfully walk through scripture. And I'm and I've already told you that that I've only really begun to do this, but you want to do that. And if they're doing subject matter, typically you want it to be systematic theology, you want it to be theological stuff another Chris criteriology. Now I'm saying those words and going, oh my God. Well if you've been watching Essentials of the Faith, then you know we've covered those kind of subject matters. That's it. That's it. Uh, again, please folks, as we walk through Corinthians uh, 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 up to chapter three, verse eleven at this point, uh, uh, please avail yourselves so that you can be up to speed with us as we're walking through it, and I pray this will inspire you to study in the same way, to, to want to go through and understand. And there's going to be some places that just kind of gets a little difficult, and this is what I'm for, and people like myself are here to help you get through those difficult passages. That said, again, having already read uh, through chapter you several times uh, for the broadcast, and you can hear me reading it, if you watch our pre broadcast, I think we can dive right in. And what we, what we do know is as Paul is carrying forth the thought, remember how chapter 3 opened, he talked about the immature. And so now we're working. We work through that, and we're working into the, to the people who are I call spiritual field hands, right? If you catch, caught our previous uh, broadcast, spiritual field, hand, field hands, excuse me. And so, so these builders, as we're actually going to, we looking at last week, we, we hit that builder metaphor uh, uh, fairly strongly. So, so, so he's still dealing with the original opening, quote unquote, of chapter three, which is, I could not come giving you meat, I had to come giving you the milk of the word. Now, it's still the word of God. We, we made these points previously, it's still the word of God. They're still Christians, they're just inner Christians. And, and, he's, and it's not the issue of per se what they're being fed or given for nourishment. It's their immaturity. There's envying and strife. And clearly, they're behaving like ones he likens to those who are actually unspiritual. You're still fleshly, essentially. You're still carnal. You're still as if you're unsaved. You're saved. You're just immature. So as he's talking about these builders, he's talking about these spiritual fillings. He's talking about these these these. these these craftsmen, these builders, I talked about last week, love that point Paul makes about by the grace of God given to me. I love that as we looked at the fact that essentially his ability to do the job as a, what he called a skilled or, or expert builder or architect there as, uh, is, is given to him not by any talents or gifts or charisma, you know, I grew up in some of the religious organizations I grew up in connection to. He's not talking about some particular charis charismatic abilities, uh, uh, wear nice suits and drive a leg. No, he's saying by the grace of God, in other words, I've been given the unmerited favor, unmerited kindness of God. I've been gifted with the capacity and ability to be an expert builder. And we talked about laying the foundation and the foundation is Jesus Christ, right? And so uh, we understand then now he's turned in a sense from immature and saying to those who are builders, because again, they said some of, I'm of Apollos, some of Paul, some said in first chapter one, I'm of, of Cephas. Some even said, hey, I'm of Christ. 
And that's a sign of your, your immaturity. So now he's saying, look, anyone who is doing the job, whether as spiritual field hands, some planting, some watering, or as skilled builders, the foundation layer, which was him in the case of the Corinthian church, and then those who come to build as well, look, their works are going to be tested, as it were, by fire. And I think that's a pretty, pretty good review, because uh, he goes on to say, as a matter of fact, that's where we ended. No one can lay another foundation. The point simply being, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And so how are you going to lay another foundation in, in Christ's church, right? So, so no one can lay another foundation because he is, Jesus is not only the foundation that is laid, he's the owner. Build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And we, we reference Ephesians chapter 1. 1 through 14, where Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, of God the Father, right? So Paul, who is one of the skilled builders, Apollos, the skilled builders, belongs to the one who also owns the church, who owns the bit. I think that's a great place to, to, to bring us to where we are tonight. Verses 12 and 13, so then, in verses 12 and 13, if anyone, a supposed servant of God, comes and attempts to build on Jesus Christ, the foundation that has already been laid, of course, thinking about the Corinthian church, uh, that has already been laid using materials that cannot stand the testing of what they've built, their works will be consumed by fire. Now, fire is going to come, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into this, dirt, and it's going to test whatever has been built. Because now he's using the metaphor building. It's still making reference to the work that has been given by God to the to the building up of the saints. We'll, we'll get into deeper, but to the building up of the saints. Where I mean, we'll just give you we'll we'll give you the end of the movie at the beginning. It's already laid out for us in the scripture. So so what we see here is no one can lay another foundation. That's all being said, and to the ones who are builders, whether it be a Paul, whether it be Apollos, or someone like Cephas or Peter, to the ones who are modern-day preachers, past teachers, which I am. So, so for all of those who are in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the preachers and teachers, he's talking to us. He's, he's, he's speaking to us as well. We can, we can glean from this text even for us. But he's he's not dismissing though. Okay, he's not talking to me now. I'm laity. He's not dismissing you, and I'm I'm gonna show you in a minute. So verses twelve and thirteen again for those who are who 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 suppose themselves servants of God in terms of the preaching and the teaching of the word of God or what we call ministers in most cases. Uh, it, if you come to build, how you build, right? Eleven. How you build and the materials you build, which, which speaks to how you build, because based on your materials, how you build. So, so how and what you use in the building uh, upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So specifically, we're not talking about what you're saying to sinners in terms of uh, uh, what you're saying to sinners as if not talking about Jesus. Let me be clear. So if you're talking about new age thinking, a positive thinking, uh, 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 and, and I say this respectfully because I know there are many on the channel who also consider themselves in this way. So if you consider yourself uh, uh, what I call modern-day guru, basically self-help coaches and life coaches, that's not a preacher. And I want to be abundantly clear. And I want to be careful here not to be offensive, but I, I got to be clear. I'm teaching the Word of God. It's called Victory in Christ Broadcasting Channel. We're not here to, to be life coaches. Ministers of the gospel are not therefore life coaches. We may address life issues per the word of God, but a life coach is not by virtue of being a life coach and getting a certificate in a six-week, six-month program, a preacher. That is not the same thing. And I, out of respect for 27 years I've done this, the 53, 52 and a half my father's done this, the 30 plus my pastor's done this, want to give respect to the fact that that's not the same thing. And we'll see in this text why we got to be really careful here. Because I know for a fact, because I can see the, the advertisements upon, upon our, our Facebook pages, that, that people who are life coaches are getting invited to revivals in Christian churches to, to, to give an address or preach. 
inviting life coaches now with positive affirmations, which is just really pack, re, new age thinking repackaged. There are those who are writing as pastors, and I won't say names at this point, who are writing under the heading of a pastor, but are just writing really nothing that's no more than new age. And we'll show you why Paul, and Paul addresses that, and that's some significant stuff. I'm just, just teasing you now, teasing you, pulling you in. Stay with me. So, so, so here in the general sense, laying, a, a, again, what are you building? Jesus is the foundation, period. So we're not even talking about now non-believers in the sense of they just reprobates and don't want to come to Christ. We have people who have who are who have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we talked about, and that's the foundation, the gospel message of Jesus, which is the power he talks about in chapter one. He talks about in Romans chapter one. We've covered that. So that now going forward, seeing that this person is a believer, laying another uh, you can't lay another foundation. So then the works and the material being used will be consumed. Now, there's no comprehensive list in, in, in verse 12, right? But certainly a telling one. So notice the, notice the building materials, metaphorically speaking, ready? Gold, silver, and costly stones, which, by the way, can withstand the intense heat of fire. Isn't that interesting? Because fire is, again, that which is being spoken of is going to 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 material. So so ironically, gold, silver, and costly stones can withstand the intense heat of fire. And in fact, each of these materials, watch this, are characteristically refined by fire. However, here's the other three that he gives: wood, hay, or stone. Now notice if you build with those things. Nah, he's making a difference now. A contrast between builders who are building uh, on the foundation of Jesus Christ with these with these things that can be tried by fire and withstand the test, and then those that cannot be. So wood, hay, and stone, wood, hay, and straw ain't gonna make, but gold, gold, uh, 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 precious stones, and so on and so forth that can withstand the fire. Stay with me. So, so as a matter of fact, uh, when I put in my notes, however, wood, hay, and straw, and straw will, will all of them go up in things, right? Those, those ingredients will go, those building materials, which are building materials, but will go up in flames. I, I hear it in my head. I'm trying not to say it. I'll huff and I'll puff, <laughs> and I'll blow your house down. Okay. Then... These materials are metaphoric, of course, I already said that, to what the servant of God is using. Now, now we're talking about the builders. He opened up with talking about those who are being built. The mature ones, it, it, the immature, excuse me, ones in particular, but he's, it, he's, he's, he's turned a subtle corner as he's going forward, and he's talking about those who are servants of God, Apollos, Paul, whoever, and he's saying, they're going to have to give an account, essentially, of the work that they're doing, their labor, ministries, ministries. As a matter of fact, I hear this question all the time. It, 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 it comes up in Bible studies. I don't care almost where I am, how many churches I've gone to in my lifetime, and even during my ministry. And people always want to ask, so what about the preachers? Are they going to get a worse chastisement, a worse punishment? Well, stay with me, because it gets addressed. It gets addressed. So metaphorically, what the servant of God is using, what the servant of God is using. One, either he is using the truth that endures to all generations, I believe Psalm 100, verse 5, or he is building, stay with me, he is building with false, vain, or useless sayings. Don't get lost in these words. Heterodoxy or heresy. A heterodox essentially is something that is off. Something, and if we're talking in returns of the word of God, something that is being taught that is that is not fully in agreement with the with the actual meanings, the what it, what is the proper interpretation might be the best way to say, right? That is a heterodox. A heresy is something that is complete in contradiction. I mean, it's just the best way to say it. So a heterodox might be in regards to and just stay with me in regards to tithes and offerings and whether or not it is meat for today. I'm not going to get into whether or not. You can, you can send me a message on Messenger or, or if you want to talk about that. But that, that's, a, that's a place where you see a lot of heterodoxies, 
uh, uh, in terms of Sabbath. Uh, there's a gentleman uh, 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 else, uh, uh, young preacher, dynamic man, uh, who is coming out of the seven day in his faith and, 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 and talking about the seven, uh, uh, the Sabbath day and talking about it in terms of where we stand as Christians, because there is certainly some, at the very least, heterodoxies there, some misunderstandings in terms of Sabbath and New Testament and so Jesus Christ, etc. Again, not getting into it, but then there is heresies. There is such as saying that God is not triune. That has been dubbed a heresy. The, uh, God is or modalism. Again, I don't want to get into that, uh, uh, but but modalism is, in my earnest opinion, a heresy. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, triunity or trinity uh, is a biblical teaching, even though the word itself is not in the scriptures, right? And so, so there are heterodoxies, things that are at the very least uh, 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 just off, and I won't say slightly because I don't want to give any impression, well, it's just barely off, but it's off. It's not, it's not in keeping with, with interpretation of scripture. And then there are those things that are just rank heresies. There are indeed, in effect, rank and foul heresies. Now, neither one of them profits anyone anything. And in fact, if they go unchecked, they can become and often are dangerous. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 18 through 20, and then we'll jump over to 2 Timothy, making reference to the same, uh, uh, the same individuals, right? 1 Timothy as New Testament gave. First Timothy chapter one. Here's what it says. Starting in verse 18. Timothy, my child, I am giving you the instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may strongly engage in battle, having faith and good consciousness. Some have rejected these and have suffered the shipwreck of the faith. Hymenaeus and Alexander are among them. I have delivered them to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Of course, you delivered them to Satan, yeah. We, we, we won't dive into that at this point, but, but uh, uh, essentially some notation suggests a, a couple of different ideas there. Uh, uh, we'll look at that again in, in, in chapter, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And, and that, that whole deliver them to Satan, notice that they may not blaspheme again. They're in this case counted as brothers, but delivered into Satan. It's some suggest, and I, I I don't fall any particular place on this, but some suggest that that may be in reference to the fact that in some way Satan has been used as an instrument by God through Paul to chasten them, to chasten them, their bodies, maybe even to bring them to sickness. Now, again, if you hear that and that disturbs your sense and sensibility, bless your heart is all I can tell you at this point. <laughs> uh, 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 Satan is an, indeed, and in fact, an instrument in God's hands. Have you considered my servant, Job? See, I, I, I want to try not to run down that, that rabbit hole, but essentially, uh, have you considered my servant, Job, is a good example of God using Satan to, to try or to test Job and, of course, finding him faithful. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 14, says this, Remind them of these things, charging them before God not to fight about words. This is in no way profitable and leads to the ruins of the hearers. See, you're born with this, the heterodoxies and potential heresies. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does... Now, notice what we're talking about in Corinthians 3, and then think about what we're talking about. We're talking about builders who have been chosen by God to, to build, to work on his building. We'll, we'll get to what that building is. You already know. See, we're, we're the temple, the sanctuary, the building of God, right? And so he's, he's talking in Timothy. He's writing, excuse me, Timothy and saying, 
uh, uh, here a verse that we often study. I love the this translation better. Be diligent. Study means to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker or a workman who does not need to shame. Here's the basis. Correctly teaching, uh, but avoid irre irreverent, empty speech for this will produce an even greater measure of godlessness. There it is, but let's go forward. And the, their word will spread like gangrene among whom are, here he is again, Hymenius and now another gentleman, Philetus. They have deviated, they have deviated from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are overturning the faith of some. Nevertheless, watch this, God's solid foundation, not foundations, foundation, you know who that is, stands firm. Have knows those who are his, that would be Jesus, and everyone who names the name of the Lord must turn away from unrighteousness. Powerful, right there. So he's, he's talking really in a very in a more precise way to Timothy because Timothy, of course, is bishop. And so he's, he's giving Timothy, as he's nearing his death, some admonishments uh, uh, concerning these who are among him or among in the group that are unfortunately believing these heresies and heterodoxies, these vain speeches, irreverent conversation, uh, for example, that the resurrection... Uh, 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 and the, the return of Christ has already happened. Uh, uh, now, again, the scholars don't know exactly how that came to be, where that particular uh, heresy, those heterodoxies came to be in their group. There's no way to know because we have no record of it. But we know during the first century that Jesus said false prophets, matter of fact, we're coming to that, would go out and come in, uh, would, would go out and be among you, excuse me. And so we know it's very possible that this is happening. That this is going on. Matter of fact, we're going to read several passages along those lines. In fact, Paul states it will be made clear or obvious not only on that day, but by the illuminating effects of that day. What will, so we don't lose the point that Paul is making in Corinthians, what these type people like Hymenius and Philetus and Alexander have been building what they have, were building and what in our age and day and time, those who are building and they are building with, with, with bad material, material that won't stand the test of the fire, on that day, their works will be exposed or will be made known. Again, it, it, in fact, Paul states it will be made clear or obvious, not only on that day, but the illuminating effects of that day. Verse 12, right? The fire will prove or test the quality of the builder's work and the materials used. Paul, Paul refers to the day or that day, which of itself could mean per hour, a period, or from dusk to dawn, the day time, right? The day hours, or even a particular age or marked out time frame. So the so that day in text could mean, if you look up that word in the Greek, it could mean any one of those things. So then we're going to have to find some kind of meaning within context. That's how that works. But in the same verse, he used the word fire, which is often indicative of judgment. Hmm. What is clear is that there is a particular day he has in mind a day his audience will certainly recognize as yet to come and the specific quality or characteristic of that day that matters most to this point is the illumination or brightness thereof because the illumination of that day and apparently the illuminating fire of that day exposes, brings light to Bring, you know, all, uh, uh, matter of fact, that day will disclose or show off the work done by each servant who builds on the spiritual foundation of Jesus Christ. So, in other words, let's just get down to it. The prison, the teachers, 
Now, we're going to go back to his metaphor, but I want to be clear. The preachers and the teachers of God's word, and even those who share God's word. So I don't want to just exempt you. Well, you know, I'm not a preacher or teacher, okay, but you're. But somebody said something in the grocery store, and you overhear them, and you start in, and you start into a conversation. So then you are putting yourself in that kind of space uh, uh, as to now Paul is referring to you as well. So even if you don't call yourself a preacher or a teacher in terms of what I do, okay, fine. But if you're teaching Sunday school, even though that may be your religious practice, but you're in Sunday school and you're, you're just regurgitating whatever the commentators are saying in the Sunday school lesson, you are held to this standard. Because you are building, I, mean, I told you I'm coming to it, you are building on the foundation that is Jesus. So don't try to exempt yourself. Well, it's not, it's not me. No, it's you too. Oh, 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 I got you, I got you. Those who share the gospel with your children and with your family. And you have the gospel and also you share your faith. You are, to a, to a degree, building. And I would suggest to you that you not try to figure out how to diminish it. You are a workman that need not be ashamed if you rightly like the word of truth. Now, am I trying to encourage you not to share your faith? By all means, please share your faith. Just be clear on what that faith is and what who that faith is in and what that means. Exactly. Not what you feel it means, what it means. Let's rush on. Note, revealed as by fire means making known things watch this previously non-existent as they come into existence and or into view so it is it is bringing to bear what was not known or existent in terms of one's thing about it and we'll see this for example you can look at romans chapter 8 verse 18. romans chapter 8 verse 18 and in that particular page making known what was not previously known would be glory. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, making known what was not previously known, so reveal by fire, if, if you will, if you were using it in that text, would be making known what was not previously known in that faith. So that's essentially uh, uh, what that passage, uh, what those passages are talking about, an example to what we're talking about tonight. So then, this, that day and revealed by fire together in the cut. We're told we couldn't just from looking at uh, that day in the Greek, we couldn't figure it out. But let's look at the context. So that day and revealed by fire in the context would suggest that the illumination, the light, the illumination of that day that discloses is not so much the sun shining. So we're apparently talking about a day. We're not talking about just a dawn, a 24-hour period. We're not talking about the sun shining, okay? So we're not talking about that, even though certainly the sun could cause something to burn up, but on but this predetermined day, whatever this day is, we still don't know, the fire will both bring to light, as fire has light, as we know, and and or expose what work has been done, and it will test it will scrutinize, it will examine, it will prove, I love those words, whether or not the work done by the builders was quality or of what sort or what matter the work is. So in other words, real simple, ladies and gentlemen, here I am teaching and preaching God's word and building on the foundation you are believers whether you're watching this live or watching this back right so you're a believer in Jesus you've got the foundation you've got the cornerstone we talked about that last week check that out so you've got the cornerstone the apostles and prophets the scriptures we're and we're using the scriptures so they are a part of the rest of the foundation so Jesus is the cornerstone and then the apostles, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, and the apostles were alluding to the writings of the law and the prophets. Just want to make sure you get a full understanding. That's the foundation on which you and I are built, right? And Jesus is the chief cornerstone, okay? He's that foundation that has been laid. Got that? Okay, good. Now, what I'm doing, what your pastor's doing, what, 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 the, what the people you listen to on YouTube and social media are doing, is they are building on that. 
building on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. You got that? All right, good. Now, what Paul says is, is that my works, now I'm included in this, the works of your pastor and others you might listen to, the devotions which you like to read, I don't care who writes them, whoever you're turning to for your spirituality sake, see how I did that? They are yielded on the foundation that is Jesus. Now, again, we hope the building material, we hope, is of God. That's what we hope. Why? Because going to get tested, and we, we he's saying, look, there is a day that is, is, that is coming, that's in the future, that is coming. He's just what he's telling them. Excuse me. That is coming, and it is a day of fire. It is a day where fire will uh, fire. Now, this is a spiritual building. So when we say fire, we're not talking about literal fire. So, so hope you understand the metaphors he's in here. He's using metaphors. He's, he's not talking about literal fire. <laughs> I'm, he's not talking about uh, uh, my preaching being burned up by fire. Okay? We're not talking about that. To understand all of this is spirit, the spiritual implications. He's just using physical metaphors. He's using natural metaphors to make a spiritual point. If I haven't said that, let me say that at this juncture, we don't get lost. So, so again, this day, which I believe is a day that is coming, and when I say a day, I don't mean a 24-hour day or a dust to dawn. I mean there is a time appointed that's coming when what I do and the pastors and so on and so forth do as builders, metaphorically speaking, are, are, are building you and building those whom we have, uh, we preach to and we teach. Our works, our building, our ministries, as we like to call them, our denominations, on and on and on, are going to be tested on that particular day, whatever that day ultimately is, and whatever that day means, is going to be tested, and our works, what I'm doing, will be exposed. It will be scrutinized. It will be examined. It will be tested. It will be proved. It will be exposed. What I've been using to build on you, if it's the word God or not, will be brought to bear. And it stands the test of time. If it is like the silver, if it is like the precious stone, if it is like gold, it's going to withstand that day and the fire of that day. I'm just, I just want to take my time there. Did I do a good job according to God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's the actual work we're talking about. Right division of the word of truth, whether in terms of declaring or preaching or in the teaching. That's good stuff. That's Paul. That, that's good stuff, Paul. If Paul was here, I'd tell him Paul good stuff. Noting, there's only that which is of God and which is not. So let's land that plane. This is a, all the clearer in verses 14 at 15. If all the work done by the builder is consistent with the foundation of Jesus Christ and therefore survives the, that day of scrutiny by fire, the builder will be rewarded if not his work or hers, uh, his work or his labor, her work or her labor will be consumed and his reward for his or her labor or for her labor lost. Now, let me let me let me get this in. Let me get this. I may even make the last point and then finish up chapter three next week because we're we're right we're right at the end. We'll see what we're talking about, and you'll hear you'll hear. Follow me on this. You'll hear older preachers as they, and I don't mean just older in years, but as they kind of age, they're starting to come to a point of talking about retirement or even passing away. And if you're privy to be uh, at the bedside of one of these individuals, right, you will hear the muse, uh, you know, sitting there, at, at, at sitting in a nursing facility. I don't know. Maybe they retire, and, and you get to talk to them about their ministry and all of that. As, as time goes on, here's a word that'll make sense to many of you, legacy. Legacy. It, it, now, Paul doesn't use that word, and so I'm very careful here, but I'm using that because it's a word that often, in particular, men use, not that women don't use it or think about it, but I've heard more often than not the term that men use. It's a term that men often concern themselves with. Let's see. 
So think about it in these terms. Maybe this will help uh, Paul's words make sense to you. Paul is saying, if you will, if you would allow me, grace me this. Paul is essentially saying, your legacy will be proved one way or another. If you were teaching what God wanted taught, your legacy, what taught, how you taught it, and I don't mean style, how you taught it in terms of right division, right, is going to be found out. So how did I open this point? Remember? What did I say? I said in this point these words. Here it is. There is only that which is of God and that which is not. So in other words, we read about Hymenaeus and Philetus and Alexander. They were either teaching is of God or not of God. Not of God, heterodoxies or heresies. Of God, proper interpretation of scripture. Rightly divider of truth. Look, look, look. Let me be clear. There is not five different types of things or 27 types of interpretations. Brothers and sisters, there either there, there either is what the Word of God says or what the Word of God doesn't say. There either is what the Word of God means by what it says or what the Word of God does not mean in what it says. There's one interpretation, many applications, as I heard uh, Bishop uh, Kenneth Omer say one time, and I'm sure many others say. One interpretation. Let me say this, and I've said this on uh, on Tuesday nights in our, our, our Essentials of the Faith. There is no agree to disagree in terms of the essentials of the faith. And Paul is not talking about the non-essentials. He's talking about the essentials. Remember, laying another foundation. He's talking about what being built on that foundation, and that foundation in me and in you is Jesus Christ. So this is very serious stuff here. So, so understand, there is either that which is of God or that which is not. And this is made all the clearer, because if it's not of God, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be scrutinized and either consumed, burnt up, because it's straw, it's hay, it's wood, or it's going to last, metaphorically speaking, or it's going to last because it's, 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 it's gold, it's silver, it's, it's precious stones, it's things that can withstand the fire. I don't, I don't know how much more plain I can be. Point that is so clear to us. That is so clear to us. So the word legacy, often when used by per people like myself, preachers, they, they reflect on their legacy. Now, they will get into whether or not they treated people well. And that's very important, too. Don't, don't, don't miss what I'm saying. It, it, well, hey, what about how they treat people? Yes, you're right, because that's a part of just being a Christian, by the way. Let love be without uh, hypocrisy. Hate the things which are evil. Cling to the things. That's, that's to everybody. Treating people a certain way is for everyone. But even if you look at what, what is said, Paul writes there talking about a, a person who wants to be a bishop or an elder, or essentially what we would also say would be an overseer or a pastor. Kind of really the same thing. It, it, essentially, this, this can't be a person who's mean and cruel and all that. So, so, so behavior does matter here. I'm not, I'm not being dismissive. It's a secondary issue to what Paul is talking about. He's, he's talking especially about the work itself. I want to make sure you get that. Don't lose that. And so, again, imagine sitting there with a pastor, right, your, your, your beloved pastor, and as he's sit, sitting there and he's reflecting over his life, his legacy, and he may say something along the lines, may, hopefully not, but he may say, you know what, I, 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 I really didn't teach it the way it's supposed to be taught. Even, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, but, but now he's... he's his, his day, giving you a hint, his day has is, is, is come. It may have already come, and now he's, he's musing before he passes on about whether or not he was a workman that needed not be ashamed, writing the body in the word of truth. Here's a few points, and I think we'll, we'll be able to, to hit these and get out of the way for this evening. A few points of notation. One, fire often is used metaphorically, as we all kind of alluded to, for both judgment and to represent the Holy Spirit. We cannot say uh, with confidence which is, re is referenced here, at least at this point, is referenced here. But the context clues suggest 
that this specific day, that day we're calling it, will be a day of judgment for sure, on which the works will be tried by fire. So we do know, even though we don't want we don't want to just land the plane firm and fast on this, that day is a day, that appointed time is a time of judgment because the works will be tested by fire. And fire in this context clearly seems to be, now we can say, uh, 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 that which is being used by God to test the works. To test the works, to test the ministry. I'm going to use the word because that's a word we use more, more frequently in our day and time. The, the, the next note here, this worker, this builder, once again, is viewed by Paul as a believer. I want to make sure we don't lose that because you might have people running through your mind. I don't know if they're a believer. Now, we'll get to chapter 4 probably in a couple of weeks. And he in verse 5, I'm giving you a hint. Judge no man before his time. So we got to be careful there. Now, I actually said this recently, well, maybe a couple of weeks ago now on the phone uh, with someone I was talking to who made, was passing some, some, some certain judgments about the, the final destination because of some hurts, personal hurts that they had suffered behind a preacher. And, and I was gentle and loving and said, uh, you can't walk down that road, biblically speaking. As a matter of fact, this was some of the time I used to help them to ease up off the throttle because uh, uh, they were ready to send them to hell, basically. The worker, the, this builder, this worker, once again, by Paul's description, is a believer is viewed as a believer, and despite them building with ungodly, worthless material, he clearly states the builder will be saved. That's not my words. The builder will be saved, but notes it will be as one who deserves hell, fire, but escapes it. Wow. Let's not rush through that. Did you get that? You get that in verse 13, 12 and 13? So he's saying, look, this this person's works, if they have they, they did not build with the proper material, they did not build with the word of God properly exegeted, properly explained, I don't care how much you love them, their works will be consumed and their reward will be gone. They will still make heaven, but their reward will be gone. As a matter of fact, you want to see an example of this? Go to Jude chapter 1, verse 9. Moses deserved to be taken by Satan, but what but was rebuked by Michael the archangel in the name of the Lord. Moses should have went to hell for striking rock. Yes, Moses. Shall I call water from this rock? He didn't make it into the promised land. His reward was lost. He did not go into the promised land. I mean, I mean, let me slow it down a little bit so we don't we don't miss something. So when people often ask this question, in judgment, is it going to be worse? There is a judgment, and there are many days of judgment in Scripture, by the way. We're not talking about white throne judgment in that sense. I don't believe this is white throne judgment here. Now, that, that is my opinion, but I don't have any reason to believe this is white throne judgment. I do believe there is a day of reckoning concerning how we lived as believers in terms of our works. These works follow them that believe. Crowns of thorns. Yeah, crowns of thorns, excuse me. Crowns of jewels. How many jewels we'll get in our crown, etc., is based on the works that we do. Not whether or not we get to heaven. White throne judgment, heaven, hell. This is a, a, a nether judgment, a nether. Now, it could happen on the same day. Again, I don't have any biblical text to say yes or no, but I'm just saying we have to be careful not to run these days as discussed together. And I believe there's going to be some text coming for, in, later on in his letter that will help us better understand this. But again, if you look at what he says, even what we read in Timothy chapter 2, I mean, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, approved unto God. Again, that word approved is, again, assessed by God and deemed approved. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, now it's opening up, right? Hebrews chapter 11. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder to those who diligently, he rewards, he approves those 
who diligently seek. He approves of those who live by faith and out of that faith diligently seek. He rewards them. And again, in chapters to come, we'll see that more, more profoundly. I think one of the, the, the great it, it, thoughts that, that I have here on this is, is it will escape from hell. Well, we see that clearly in the cases of Moses. And I lost my thought, unfortunately. I'm getting young, I'm getting young. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> so so let, let, last quick point here. Uh, uh, this should not, however, be confused with false teachers, apostles, and prophets who are categorized as wolves, ravening wolves, who, who are in and among the sheep, wolves and sheep clothing, as some of us like to suggest. We got a little time here. Let's read some, let's read some scriptures. And even after all that, I still did it. Chapter 7, starting at verse 15. Here's what it reads. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly are but inwardly are ravening wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot, cannot, cannot produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every good tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, there it is again, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Who? The ravening wolves. Those who are wolves in sheep clothing. I, that's context, I never knew you. Never. They were not believers. Depart from me. You, you lawbreakers or workers of iniquity, some translations say. Did it? Depart from me, you were. They were never, I never knew you. Acts chapter 20. We've got a few minutes left. Let's, let's get it in. Acts chapter 20. Starting at verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock same, same metaphor, same analogy, among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, pastors, elders, etc., to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased by his own blood, just called uh, uh, Jesus God. I'm sure you figured that out. I know that after my departure, savage wolves with, with his saviors, with our savior, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And when, excuse me, and men from among yourselves will rise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I did not stop warning each one of you with tears. Deviant doctrines. We're consistent in our understanding of the scripture. Finally, 2 Peter chapter 2. I want to get some scriptures in. I want to get some scriptures in. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 and 19 says, For uttering bombastic empty words, they seduce by fleshly desires and debauchery People who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption since people are slaves of corruption since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. And on and on and on and on and on. Were the clearest examples of this. 
The clearest examples. We got some time. Yeah, we do. Let's let's get it in. Matthew chapter twenty-three. Matthew chapter twenty-three. Matthew chapter twenty-three. Our time is limited, so let me just get it in. Starting at verse one. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you. And you and observe it or do it. But don't do what they do. But don't do what they do. Because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up they tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to remove them, to remove those heavy loads, those burdens. They do everything to observe, to be observed or seen, some translations say, by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greeting in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi by the people. And this is where people, unfortunately, will go on about titles. Be careful with that. He's not saying titles are the issue. He's saying the mentality or the attitude by which one pursues titles are the issue. Essentially, they don't just teach that, that which is ungodly. They encourage behavior that is equally ungodly, for they themselves are as such. Let me do that again. So here's the distinction. They don't just teach that which is ungodly, heterodoxies and heresies. They also encourage that which is ungodly. They have behavior that is ungodly. They are the tree that is bad, that has got bad fruit, which means the tree is a bad tree. How those verses come together? If you if you need any more clarification, please message me. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. I want to make sure you see the difference. The the type of that Paul is referring to are misguided unskilled, untrained laborers or preachers and teachers, untrained builders in the vineyard of God. They are, as one saying would have it, they were not sent, they just went. And I think that's a perfect place to end. So we'll start in on 16 and 17, and we might just get to the end of it. So I pray, uh, our brothers and sisters, has been a blessing to you. Uh, uh, this has been a blessing to you. Please share this out. How do you do it? Once I end, I'll end it. It'll populate into the page. You're on your laptop or, or you're on a, a PC, or even if you're just on the channel, you may have to go out of the channel, come back in, and then you will see it and click into it, right, you know, right click or whatever the case may be, depends on your device you're using. Copy that URL. Paste it on our page. If it allows a share button, share it. Share it onto your page. Brothers and sisters, let's get this word out to the people of God. If you feel led to, to be a, a financial help to the ministry, I am full-time in ministry. Yes, I am a, a pastor at Granny Church, uh, but I am full-time. I see I do more than just that, right? So I'm full-time in the ministry, and if God leads you to be a blessing, we would appreciate it. The information is available. We especially want you to connect with us on YouTube. Connect people to YouTube. If they don't do Facebook, but they do YouTube, please do that. That being said, brothers and sisters, be blessed. And we hopefully will see you this Thursday at Central Standard Time for Sunday School in Review. Again, be blessed.